So before I, I, I start this talk, let me give just a little bit of context about what I do in my day-to-day uh, -day life. I work for an organization called the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, we're a 501c3 nonprofit in San Francisco. Uh, we're membership-based. Um, we do digital civil liberties work. We defend uh, the rights and freedoms of internet users. Um, we work on a range of topics using a range of tools. Uh, one tool that a lot of the organization uses is impact litigation. We're like the ACLU for the internet. Uh, major victories have included legalizing strong cryptography using First Amendment arguments in the United States, fighting against uh, surveillance in various forms, including getting a constitutional ruling holding that the gag orders in national security letters made them unconstitutional, uh, and uh, a long uh, and sometimes victorious, sometimes less victorious fight against uh, warrantless wiretapping by the NSA. Defending innovation um, against diverse threats, including patent trolls, excessive copyright laws, uh, network neutrality violations by major ISPs and, and, and um, uh, carriers. We do policy and activism work uh, to back up all of that, that impact litigation. So if you remember the day the internet went dark in the campaign against Soper and Pippa, uh, that was a, a campaign that kind of snowballed and started out of EFF's offices, became much larger by the end. Um, our campaigning work on cybersecurity uh, is pretty prominent. We also, as an organization, build technology, and that's the team that I lead at EFF. Um, some of the work that we've done uh, that's relevant and interesting. Um, we have a tool called Privacy Badger you can install in Firefox and Chrome that will protect you against uh, creepy tracking by advertising companies. We have, and this is especially relevant, I think, to folks at Berkeley uh, this week, uh, we have a tool called HTTPS Everywhere that you can install in your browser, which will ensure that where possible, where there's an HTTPS version of a site that is available and an encrypted secure version, uh, but it's not the default, you install this and you'll automatically get the, the, the encrypted version. And that means that some portion of your browsing history that could be exposed to network surveillance, whether it's by um, uh, a government of some sort, you know, the US government while you're here, other governments while you travel, or whether it's by a large institution that's recording all of your data uh, off the network, uh, you'll get some kind of pr significant protection uh, from HTTPS everywhere. So that's, that's trying to deploy encryption from the client side. We also have a project called Let's Encrypt that we launched recently with uh, Mozilla primarily, but also a coalition of other organizations. Uh, and that's trying to, to solve the server side of the piece. It's very hard to make web servers speak secure encrypted protocols, uh, or at least it was very hard until we launched Let's Encrypt. It's now getting much easier. Uh, you can see this thing just launched in December. There are already 500,000 certificates and actually something like 2 million domain names in those certificates that are starting to use uh, this new tool. So in, in my day-to-day -day work, I, I, I work with a team of people on these kinds of projects, but since I'm out here, um, uh, you know, at Berkeley, uh, and it's more of an academic setting. I'm going to give a slightly more academic talk today. Um, uh, uh, actually, I guess we can't escape the practicalities of things out here. Uh, Berkeley is both a great place to talk theoretically about computer security and also a great place to, uh, to deal with really practical computer security threats that you need to protect yourself against. Uh, so we have both. But my topic for today, um, going back to the beginning, uh, if I can jump through these slides. Um, my topic today is to try and develop a predictive theory of computer security. Um, if there are multiple parties uh, who want computers or networks to do different things, um, how can we predict um, which of them are going to succeed? Now, traditionally, um, just jumping back through these slides very slowly, I think these images are really large and causing my computer to... Uh, to resize them is, is slow. Um, uh, if we ask this question traditionally, I I at least computer scientists and uh, security auditors, when they look at a computer program and ask, is this thing secure, most commonly ask two questions. They say, can I run code on your computer? Um, if you ran a web server on your computer, can I break in and put my code inside your web server? Or if you have a browser on your computer or an email, some email software on your computer, can I send a carefully crafted web page or a carefully crafted email to you that will get me uh, the ability um, to run code on that system? And then secondarily, they might say, if I can run code on your computer in some way, can I run uh, any kind of code I want, or do I have some limits on what I can do? 
if um, I give you an app and you install it, is the app limited to only doing certain things on your phone, or does it have complete control over the phone? If I get you to come to a web page and the web page has a little JavaScript or Flash thing, game that, that's playing, is the game kind of sandboxed and limited so that it only lives in that browser tab? Or can it somehow get out um, and access the rest of the computer? Uh, or if I give you a computer program, uh, the old-fashioned way, for those of you who are familiar with Unix, you know, a computer program that you want to run as your user, does that computer program also get access to the root account, the administrator account on the system? So these are the, the way we usually, uh, this is the way we usually frame the question. But, um, you know, it, it, it's interesting to ask where you can go from here. Um, uh, and one of the, the, the uh, 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 and what, what predictions it makes. And one of the predictions that's widely, most widely made, I think, from this fundamental situation uh, is that in computer security, if there's an attacker and a defender, one person who's trying to protect a computer, another person who's trying to break into it, the attacker always wins. Um, and to quote Bruce Schneier on this subject, um, security designers occupy what Prussian general Karl von Clausewitz calls the position of the interior. A good security product must defend against every possible attack, even attacks that haven't been invented yet. Attackers, on the other hand, only need to find one security flaw in order to defeat the system. And they can cheat. They can collude, conspire, and wait for technology to give them additional tools. They can attack the system in ways the designer never thought of. So this is a profound pessimism uh, about computer security that um, uh, is being predicted from this basic way that we do things. Your web browser that you run every day contains millions of lines of code. Even though a lot of effort is put into it, those millions of lines of code contain thousands or tens of thousands of bugs that can be exploited by a crafty adversary to get control of your computer. And so if you look at the release logs of Firefox or Chrome or Safari or Internet Explorer every month, like clockwork, there are new security vulnerabilities that are being found uh, and fixed by, the, by the, um, uh, the developers of those things. But Correspondingly, each of those was a door through which an adversary may have actually slipped or could have if they'd uh, spent the time looking for it. And so these doors are always there. But, you know, this pessimism also doesn't seem to quite capture the, the reality of the situation. Um, and it doesn't explain sufficiently, the, the predictive aspect of it doesn't explain sufficiently what really happens on real computers. So consider an actual device, a typical desktop computer like the one I'm presenting off here and there are a couple more in the audience. Quite a lot of people actually have the ability to run code uh, uh, on, on that computer. Suppose, for instance, it's a Lenovo laptop like mine. Um, on that system, there's an operating system produced by Microsoft. Uh, typically by default. Maybe I've replaced it, but produced by someone. There's a BIOS uh, produced by Intel, uh, Lenovo, and perhaps some other contractors who produced parts of it. Um, there are applications that I've chosen to install from literally dozens of sources and companies, including browsers, antivirus software, system utilities, an email program, chat programs, graphics software, screensavers, games from Lord knows where, um, all of this stuff is running code on this device. If it's a Lenovo laptop, it may have some malware that was put in on there by Lenovo, uh, which they, they actually did superfish, uh, which is pretty noteworthy. Um, uh, and then some of this software, uh, including the browsers, a copy of Acrobat if I have one, a copy of Flash, is actually designed itself to run other software automatically under various circumstances. Um, and so each of these things is itself like a little operating system, a little jail that supposedly contains in, in, in a sandbox the code that, say, a website feeds to it. But of course, uh, those sandboxes, uh, many of them date back with, with code to the 90s, uh, and they're full of bugs. And so there's been a constant struggle um, to prevent Flash applications, for instance, from taking control of your computer uh, if they're malicious. And that's, that's not all. Um, you know. You look at the computer, 
and, and look inside it, start taking it apart, you find a disk, a graphics card, cameras, ethernet ports, a wireless card, a Bluetooth card, uh, maybe a cellular modem if it's an expensive computer, um, de little device management processes that are actually inside the CPU, but are a little tiny CPU with a separate operating system on it inside your, your CPU that you don't have control over. And each of these um, are essentially tiny computers uh, inside the larger one uh, with software from different people, different sources. Um, and they are intimately attached um, to the computer. And uh, you know, all sorts of other stuff is in intimately attached. A keyboard, uh, a mouse maybe, a headset, a uh, USB thumb drive, an SD card, your smartphone. You carry it around, you plug it in with that little cable to your, f to your computer, and now the two things are attached to each other. Tablets, network routers, uh, whatever those are doing, um, th they have a wire that connects straight down to your machine. Um, and all of these uh, subsystems uh, run, run code from different places. Uh, and of course, after you've gone through this list, finally you can include uh, the person who owns the laptop. Um, like I'm just sort of, you know, kind of an afterthought after all of these other actors. Um, uh, but, you know, if the person who owns the laptop is a programmer, she can write code herself. Uh, she can sit down and type in a program and say, I want my computer to do this, uh, and perhaps it will do it. Um, or, more abstractly, if she's not a programmer, she might install uh, some software with intent. You know, not just sort of, well, I, I put this program on my, on my computer when I, when I got it and I've forgotten about it since, but she may uh, say, okay, I want to see if my computer has free space on its hard drive. I want to see what's on its hard drive, so I'm going to download a program and try and run it with intent for a spe specific purpose. I'm going I'm to observe what it does and, um, and see if it does what I expect. But, of course, commonly with computers, they don't do what you expect, and so she may uh, take radical steps uh, if she encounters uh, a program not doing what she expects, like reinstalling the operating system. I mean, how many people here in this room have reinstalled their operating system in response to a computer not doing what they wanted it to? About two-thirds of you. Great. Uh, this is an important and empowering step. Uh, of course, you can also just call the IT department, um, uh, who may be on your side and helping you. Um, uh, or not, it depends, it's circumstantial. Um, uh, and attackers can actually attempt to commandeer any of the last 10 slides worth of stuff that I've just told you about. They can decide that the best way into the computer is a, an exploit that gets them from JavaScript in control of Chrome, in your Chrome browser, um, and then control of your operating system from there. That's the hard route these days. Uh, it may be much easier to wait until um, you plug in a USB keyboard, uh, or you, your phone is attached to the computer, or to send uh, a compromised, you know, a packet from a compromised router um, that you weren't expecting. Uh, uh, the NSA, of course, uh, in, in the Snowden leaks, we learned that, that it was one of their favorite tricks was to have control of the little router uh, over there in the, the corner that no one was paying attention to and to use it to do very subtle things uh, to affect the computers on the network. Um, so, in the typical theoretical framework that we're used to using as computer scientists, if you ask the question, who of these actors the makers of your, your f hard drive firmware, the maker of your operating system, Lenovo, uh, Google making Chrome, uh, Norton making our antivirus, um, the user herself, who of these people controls the computer? And the answer is all of them do. Every one of these actors uh, can run arbitrary code and make the computer uh, do something. And so I want to ask the question, what happens when these actors disagree in their objectives? What happens if one of them wants the computer to do one thing and another wants it to do another? Who can we expect, uh, if, we can, if we can have any definite expectations, who can we expect to have the advantage uh, in that contest? Uh, and so this is like, I don't know how many of you know what this thing is up on the screen. Um, it is a depiction of a game that dates back from the 1960s that was played on computers called Core Wars. Uh, and the idea of Core Wars was you'd make a very simple computer. Uh, I guess all computers in the 60s were simple by modern standards. Um, and then you'd put two computer programs into the, into the computer, and then you'd, you'd let them both run. And the last computer program left standing would win. Um, and so they just have to figure out a way of finding the other program and then messing with it so that it crashed into a wall, you know, crashed. Um, and so 
it seems like it's kind of, if, 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 if Lenovo is trying to install man in the middle uh, software on my computer and Google is trying to protect me against that with an updated copy of the browser, um, it's kind of like Core Wars. Like, who, who's going to move first? There are all these different strategies they could try. Um, and so I'm going to make some predictions, uh, just speculative ones, um, about who's going to have the advantage here. So one variable that I think is clearly super important is the resource, resource level and skill levels of the contestants. Um, if, if Alice, using her computer, doesn't really uh, know much about computers and doesn't have much time to spend chasing down mysterious error messages when she sees them, she's not in a great situation. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a uh, team of re really uh, like you know hotshot PhDs that you hired out of Berkeley and have put to work on your browser, maybe you're you're in a better position here. Um, second variable: the ability of the contestants to access and debug uh, the results on the con contested systems. So you know when we're playing cores, often the result is crash. Right? The thing didn't do what you expected. Uh, one program overwrote part of another, modified its behavior. And so um, if you can see whether you, whether you won, if you can, you can figure that out, um, you are going to be in a better position than if you're flying blind, putting some code on the machine and then not getting to see the consequences. So that actually leads to a prediction. You know, um, uh, one of the vectors of attack we've seen in cybersecurity contests, the NSA wants to destroy, whether, whether it's the NSA or Israel, someone wants to destroy some uh, centrifuges in Iran. They, they put malware out there that tra travels by USB key to get past uh, the, the network air gap uh, for those systems. But you're flying blind at that point. So you have a big set of hurdles to overcome if you can't look at the results uh, of your code on the systems that it's running on. Third variable, um, uh, and I guess I guess these two are coupled, right? You, you, you can have access, and then you, you have a question about can you tell if you succeeded or not? Um, if you can tell, then if you don't succeed, you can keep trying. Whereas if you can't tell at all, uh, then you kind of don't ever know whether you should keep working. And so this creates a really interesting contrast um, between two types of computer security. Um, uh, the first one uh, I'm going to talk about, imagine you own a supercomputer and you're using it to perform weather simulations. So you want to predict next week's weather and you fill up all of your like 500 or 10,000 or however many cores it is with code to run weather simulations and someone comes along and hacks your computer and starts using it to, I don't know, uh, like crack passwords. Because um, you've got a nice giant supercomputer, it'd be really great to be able to crack passwords with this thing. So they come o come along and they um, remove or, or pause your weather simulation software and run a password cracker. You're going to notice pretty fast if that happens, because next week's weather simulation is either going to just not exist at all, or they're going to have to fake it in some way, and you're going to look at it and go, "Wait a minute, this doesn't look like the right data." Um, in contrast. If the question is, uh, in terms of, say, w playing with passwords here, I ask the question, is there a piece of software that's running on my laptop that is going to steal a copy of my password uh, or a copy of my secret private key off, my, off Google's web server and send it to some intelligence agency? How do you know if that happened? If it does happen, it's going to be a tiny amount of code that runs just once or very occasionally and sends very subtle messages um, back out over the network. We know that you know when 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 some of the intelligence agencies stole passwords, what they would do is they'd encrypt them and then put them in a an advertising cookie in your browser, and then they'd sit and watch for that advertising cookie out to go out over the network. So super subtle. Right? There's no way anyone's going to go, wait a minute, an advertising cookie, that's stealing my password, right? Um, so, um, so if what you're trying to do uh, in your contest here is something where you can tell you can win, you're in much better shape than if you're boxing at shadows and, and speculating. Uh, and, the, and you know, these things almost look like converses of each other sometimes. For the people who are stealing the passwords, it's really easy for them to tell, oh yeah, I got the password. Or I didn't, I've got to keep trying. Um, so much of the narrative, if you, if you look at people talking about uh, computer security that happens, the theoretical narrative is around arms races. 
You know, people on one side do one, take one set of steps and then people on the other side counteract them and then they, like there are these sequ series of responses um, that are added on top of each other. Uh, and for instance, uh, those arms races have been a constant source of innovation. Uh, in malware development. Really sophisticated developments like polymorphic code. So antivirus software would go and look for specific strings that, or a series of bytes that would indicate the presence of a virus or some malware on a system. And so what did the malware authors do? They figured out that they could write code that every time it copied itself, it performed a transformation. It would find a way of, of getting different bytes, totally different bytes that did the same thing as the previous set of bytes. Each instruction in the in the code might be transformed in some ways, uh, and then uh, then the, the the byte checking no longer works. Um, so I have a prediction here: iteration in these arms races is not significantly determinative of uh, who's going to win. Um, the arms races are a distraction; um, they don't largely change who has the advantage unless they somehow change one of the underlying variables that I'm pointing at. Uh, predictively. So, fourth variable, and this is a really interesting one, is about physical access. So, what is the difference between trying to keep control of your own laptop, the one that's in your hands or in your bag or uh, in your room at night, and trying to keep control of some computer on the other side of the planet that you pay $5 a month for access to? or that you left in a data center um, and you don't go back to very often. What difference does it make to be right there next to the computer? Uh, and the implication here is that physical access can convey certain advantages, but only if you know how to use physical access well. Um, so what I'm talking about here is if I have physical access and I don't trust the computer, I can pull it apart, replace the hard drive, reflash the BIOS, um, uh, take, out, like, take out a CD and install a new operating system, whatever it is, I can perform these drastic interventions that give me a great deal of power against an adversary. My adversary spent a lot of time developing malware for my previous operating system, and then I installed Cubes uh, or uh, Tails or some other secure OS, or just switched to a different one. Now they have a huge amount of work to do. But this is not going to help a user who isn't super sophisticated. She isn't going to know when to go and reinstall her computer. Uh, and so it's only when you know. It's only when you can tell, oh, my machine is compromised, or I have a pretty high likelihood of knowing that my machine is compromised. I'm now going to use my physical access to trump my adversary, that this, this variable is relevant. So let's talk about some case studies. Um, and actually, I, I'm going to add one. We'll get to it. Um, so, cryptoviral malware. Uh, this is interesting. This is a thing that that security geeks loved to hypothesize about uh, for years. Um, they talked about how you could write some kind of ransom software that would get onto people's computers and encrypt their data and then demand a payment um, uh, in exchange for decrypting it all. Um, and this was largely speculative and sci-fi stuff until uh, 2013, uh, when suddenly this piece of malware called uh, CryptoLocker uh, spread really widely and started being extremely successful at extorting payments out of people using uh, encryption of their data combined with a, a demand for bitcoins. So the appearance of bitcoins um, gave uh, gave these groups in Eastern Europe a good way of demanding very hard to trace money from people all over the world. Uh, and they raised, in the first few months of having this, this malware out there, they got, I think, 300,000 people to pay ransoms. Um, on the, and the, the ransoms were on the order of, sorry, maybe 100,000 people, and it was 300 US or 300 Euro to get your drive decrypted. Um, so this is obviously really bad. Um, and it also, uh, it also illustrates how the variables play out. Um, the person who's trying to prevent this from happening to their computer, uh, I guess they can tell that it's happened, but only once it's too late. Uh, whereas the attacker can go around and look for exploits that get them code on a machine, and eventually when they get some, uh, they get the drive encrypted, and they know that they, they won because they get the ping back saying, another machine's encrypted, uh, and then they can uh, proceed in, in taking the Bitcoin payment if they want to to, to decrypt. So this is pretty bad. 
um, uh, the Iranians uh, had some advantages um, in defending their systems against uh, malware uh, like Stuxnet. But uh, it turns out probably they just lost on a combination of only needing to lose once and resources. Uh, you know, if the adversaries you're up against are willing to spend tens, $10 million hiring people to find one series of exploits to get onto your system, um, uh, and you don't have defense in depth that you can deploy, uh, you're in trouble. Now this actually is the really fun one, I think, for Berkeley. Um, so so this, is the, uh, this is the slide uh, from the Snowden documents that explained how it was that the NSA had access to all of your Gmail, all of your, um, uh, all of your documents on these web cloud services that people thought were encrypted. Uh, and what it shows here is the architecture of the, the HTTPS encryption um, going into and out of Google. So uh, over here we have ordinary internet users um, speaking an encrypted protocol, TLS, HTTPS, or SSL, wh whatever you call it. Um, this is the secure version of web browsing. You're connecting to Google. But actually, the, the encryption doesn't go all the way to the place where Gmail or Docs or other things are actually sitting in a data center. There's this thing called the Google front end, uh, which is the place where the encryption stops. For practical reasons, the network was architect architected like this. And then this little smiley face, SSL added and removed here. Um, and what this meant was that the NSA had found a way of being able to perform packet recording, packet capture, uh, of the same sort that Berkeley is now performing, um, somewhere in here. Uh, and they were able to get access, uh, access to all of the Gmail that way. Uh, now, Google quickly patched that, but they, they only were able to patch that or able to, to, to deploy that defense when they, they got to peek behind the curtain. The predictive variable uh, here was, did Google know if the NSA had access to everyone's email? And the answer was, Probably not. They probably had no idea until this information leaked. Um, and so if you, are, you have the same question with your own network, you know, can you tell if someone is recording all of the traffic on the wire? Uh, most of the time you can't tell either way. Uh, and so the, the important lesson there, I think, is that we shouldn't expect to be able to defend our networks against being uh, recorded. Uh, what we should be doing is engineering our computers, uh, both our servers and our devices, so that we are safe regardless of whether. Um, uh, actually, the NSA didn't have a u universal packet capturing program for every byte the way that Berkeley does, but uh, the UK government did. Uh, the GCHQ had a program called Tempora, um, which for, could keep all the data traveling into and out of the, uni the United Kingdom and a lot of data off fiber optic networks for three days. Um, so 30 days, which you guys have around here, is longer, um, considerably longer. Maybe, maybe Tempora keeps the data for longer now too because uh, this was a few years ago. So um, we, we can expect um, to lose uh, any of these recording conversations and we're going to have to figure out ways of building a more robust type of encryption, ideally, all the way from one person's phone to another person's phone, um, or all the way from my laptop to yours, so that it doesn't matter if the network in between um, is, is compromising your, your communications. And so um, that's the reason you should install Tor. It's the reason you should install HTTPS everywhere. It's the reason if you run a website that you should deploy um, uh, Let's Encrypt. Um, and it perhaps applies more generally uh, to the security of cloud systems. Uh, you put a, a spreadsheet up there, <coughs> you talk on Slack and use that to, organization your, to organize your organization's affairs, or um, you use um, uh, Asana, whatever it is. Um, the predictions look like those systems, any place where you centralize a lot of decrypted data uh, and you want to keep people from being able to get in. Um, if we go back and look at our predictive variables, um, uh, this one might be a draw, depending on who's coming after your data. Um, you have a slight advantage here, except if one of your adversaries gets a shell uh, or a compromises an employee at the cloud service provider, it's now even. 
Um, and you can't tell if they've succeeded, and they can tell if they're reading your, uh, reading your documents. So the last topic um, that I think I want to close on, and then I, I really want to open this up to conversation, and this is like you know, kind of a, a nice fun application, is uh, the security of artificial intelligence systems. Um, and I usually like to talk about this in pure, like, crazy sci-fi terms. You know, what is a world where there are intelligent beings running around and um, existing inside computers look like? Um, and I think one of the things it looks like is potentially a kind of dangerous world because those beings... Um, to zeroth order are going to have a lot of problems with computer security. You know, you and I don't have to worry about um, waking up one day and having malware that's taken over our bodies. Actually, that's not quite true. Um, I, I suppose arguably viruses, like li the literal virus types are that sort of thing. But you don't have to worry that some other human on the other side of the planet might have designed a custom virus to take over your body and use it for their own purposes, uh, which is a thing we, we have trouble, fortunately, we have trouble doing that with ordinary viruses. But we, you know, if you're an artificial intelligence, you can break into someone else's computer and use it for your own purposes, you know, some, some other AI's computer. And so if, if that's the world that exists, if artificial intelligence comes to pass, then it's kind of a world where everyone's paranoid and afraid of each other uh, and attacking each other. Now, there may also be um, some slight causes for optimism. Um, uh, I think this example might be enough uh, to give us a little bit more reassurance. The AI um, that's trying to live inside a computer looks a little bit more like the thing over here on the left, the supercomputer, than it does uh, like a system that needs to prevent its password from being stolen. So maybe if AIs have some kind of alarm, or some kind of watchdog on them saying, hey, are you still there? Are you still you? You know, if your code looks really different today than it did yesterday, maybe I'm going to call a human over to uninstall you and re restore you from a backup. Uh, and then and then figure out what happened. Um, so I, I think there are some interesting little predictions here. But but you know the, like the AI stuff isn't just sci-fi as well. Actually, I mean the, the, the thing I was the scenarios I'm talking about definitely are. But actually, uh, the AI computer security security boundary is starting to be a you know a real uh, fruitful one. So this is a um, a screenshot from DARPA. DARPA is running a, a contest at the moment called the Cyber Grand Challenge. Um, and the Cyber Grand Challenge is really interesting. It's actually like really cool and a little bit terrifying. Um, what this contest is, is a contest for computer programs, AIs, to play a game called Capture the Flag against each other. Um, uh, there's actually, a, I guess, a team here. But is anyone here from the Berkeley uh, Cyber Grand Challenge team? There is, a, there is a team at Berkeley that's, that's uh, part participating in this, uh, this contest. Um, and so what a Capture the Flag contest is, is a game where all of the teams playing get given software at the beginning of the game. Much as we get given a copy of Chrome or and a copy of Microsoft Windows or Mac OS X, and we have to live with it, right? At the beginning of the game, you're given a copy of some standard software that everyone has. And then, the aim is to keep your computer secure and running that software while breaking into the other computers in the contest that are also running the same software. And so there are two aspects to this. There's offense, where you study these programs and you find bugs in them. And then you can use the bugs to score points against the other people. But you can also modify your own copy in some way uh, to prevent it from being vulnerable to a bug you found. Uh, and what this screenshot is, is actually a code execution of a, a one of these sample programs in the game, um, where one of these uh, tra execution traces shows the program is vulnerable and has been compromised, or arbitrary code is executed remotely against it. The other one uh, is safe, but it was made safe by a patch that was written by a computer program in the course of a contest. So the computer program studied the binary went, hey, wait a minute, I can find a crash input. OK, but here's a patch. With the patch in place, we're no longer vulnerable. So this is uh, you know, a kind of more automated, uh, more like 
uh, crazy, I think, actually, version of, of fuzzing and static analysis. Um, but you can also see it as largely an attempt to strengthen um, this variable. You know, right now, you can only defend a network if you have a lot of smart people working on it. The interesting provocative proposal here is let's get computers to start providing the resources that audit our systems uh, and make them more secure. And I think that's potentially both a great idea and also slightly frightening because if, you, if you're going to start doing this, it needs to happen everywhere. All of our systems need to have these uh, kinds of defense on them. Otherwise, you know, you can imagine this could go horribly wrong uh, in some way, right? Like all it would take would be a really good AI fuzzing program that could find a bug in any, in any system out there on the internet. And all it would need would be a lot of computers to run the, 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 the AI uh, calculations, or the, you know, the, the, search, the fuzzing calculations on, but you've got a positive feedback loop. If you can compromise a thousand computers, they can start fuzzing for exploits that get you the next 10,000, and then uh, you have some uh, 21st century version of the Morris worm, which of course was a, uh, the first piece of malware that shut down the internet um, almost by accident. Um, it was kind of a grad student's project to, 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 to try and uh, uh, patch, you know, and play with some exploits, and it went kind of wrong. Let's hope there isn't a 21st century version of that. So that's my, that's my predictive theory, that we should think about these variables uh, and that thinking about them helps us to understand the likely consequences of computer security contests. Um, but I'd love to open up to questions, uh, provocations, disagreements, and uh, discussion about Berkeley's network. Um, just one note, if you want to ask a question, we are recording this, so we do have some mics, so if you could wait to ask your question until you get the mic, that would be great. And please give your name and where you're from, just so we don't say Or make one up. Or make one up. That's fine, too. Questions? Yeah, I no? I have a question. <laughs> so in the example that you gave with the malware and people sort of extorting for money, what, what were your alternatives if you didn't pay the money and, and what was the resolution of that? So your alternatives were, if you had backups, you could restore them. Uh, one interesting problem that some people hit was that their backups, if they didn't notice what had happened quickly enough and they had the wrong kind of backup system, you could have the, f the problem where you had backups and then the backups got overwritten with encrypted copies uh, of your backups and you didn't have the key. Uh, so a lot of people just lost their data. Um, a few people, I think, were able to hack into the server that was issuing the decryption keys and um, and managed to decrypt devices, like a small number of devices that way perhaps. But fundamentally there isn't uh, an answer to this other than having had backups. Some, some people like Dropbox were able to say, oh, we, you didn't think you had version backups with us. We actually been versioning your, your backup. So you, it looks to you like you don't have access to the, um, the unencrypted version of your files, but we have copies of them. There are a few cases like that uh, where people were saved, but actually this was kind of a disaster. It I think it continues to be. I think uh, this malware is still out there in you know, evolving forms. Hi, my name is Mark. Um, just piggybacking on the, um, <clears throat> what you were talking about. There's a great radio lab about a lady on the East Coast um, that had her um, information pretty much um, ransomed by a hacker group. And she had to pretty much um, pay in bitcoins to get her information released. Um, I believe the radio lab is called Dark Code. Uh -huh. But yeah. Hey, so um, great talk. It was re really interesting. Um, so I have kind of a rhetorical device here. But I I'd like to see what you think about it. So I would say that a lot of people's computers are ransomware in the sense that the systems are so already so complicated it would be impossible for someone to really know how to get their data out of it or where their data even is. Um, and you know, in your models, I noticed that the human is kind of out of the loop in that regard. The user's mental model of how the system works. So I wonder if that's, that's also something you consider if that's outside of your concerns a bit. Well, I think that the human um, is very differentially in the loop. I think that most people um, don't have any direct ability to inject code into the computer that they're using. What they at best can do is say, oh, I need a thing to do X for me. 
Maybe I can Google for one and see if I find it. Um, oh, I need a better browser. Maybe I can install Firefox or Chrome. Right? I, like I need a, I, th th there might be some malware on my computer. Maybe I can install some antivirus software. Although often when you try to install antivirus software, you actually get malware, right? Because it's very visually hard to tell the difference between the two things. Um, uh, and so I, I think that there is a huge agency problem. It's only really programmers and very sophisticated users who do actually have enough understanding of what's going on to be able to use their special position to any effect. Uh, and I don't have an answer to that. I think that um, you know it's easy to say, oh, we should educate people more uh, in computer programming and then computer security in particular. But that's like a, an enormous and quixotic undertaking on some level. We might be able to move the literacy uh, needle from you know five percent to twenty percent or something. But uh, fundamentally, uh, these things are really complicated, and we don't have institutional arrangements that, uh, aside from you know buy into Apple's universe and hope they look after you, or buy into your IT department's universe and hope they look after you. Yeah. Um, I have a question on the differentiation of um, digital access and physical access. Because, I mean, all the digital access is like ultimately physical as well. So how do you differentiate the two? Uh, I think that physical lets you do a few things that are special. I maybe should have explained this more clearly. One thing that it lets you do is um, kind of get access to any of the ports in the machine. So you can put a CD-ROM drive in there. You can plug a USB key in or pull one out. Whereas a remote attacker kind of has to live with the state of the system as it is. They, can, they may be able to upload some code to the device, but they like if that doesn't work, they don't have a fallback mechanism. So that's one different thing that the person who's physically there gets. Another is that the person who's physically there can inspect what the machine is doing, right? It, to a degree that's hard over the network. You can actually say, oh, like, what is that little blinking light in the corner? Like, why is the hard disk LED flashing right now? Or why is the screen not showing me what I expected when I rebooted the machine? And so I think those kinds of... Um, those kinds of differences that the, f the person who's physically present has give them a slight advantage, but only if they're knowledgeable enough to know what to do with it. But don't you think all those can be achieved digitally as well? Potentially, but it's again a lot of work to debug your stack, right? So you could try to have a you know, remote disk light that lets you like, tell how much I.O. is happening on that machine. But of course, then you have to support every piece of hardware for every device that you're you're running on and you can't tell if you've got a reliable disk meter for every like machine you compromise or whatever it is. Uh, and then you also have the problem of loudness, right? If you're, if, you're, if you're getting a little ping back from a compromised machine every moment saying whether it's doing disk I.O. or whether the admin is about to reboot it, that itself becomes a signal that someone can look for. Um, Ashwin Matthew, back at Clearinghouse. Uh, thank you again for a wonderful talk, as others said. Uh, looking at your variables and the way that you've laid this out, it seems to me that your argument is that the only response that we have is by building more technology, right? But it also sounds like we have contestants whose intentions may change over time and whose relationships to one another might change over time. So what responses would you conceive of, if any, that might not involve purely technological responses? Well, I think that there are institutional responses as well as technological ones that address all, probably all of these variables. Resources and skill. I mean, this is not really a... I mean, yes, DARPA trying to automate fuzzing is, is a technical a answer to this, but mostly resources and skill are a matter of deployment of money uh, and culture. Uh, and so if we have a culture where... Um, or, or, or a society where uh, defensive computer security is prioritized where um, uh, large corporations and governments get together and say, how are we going to uh, ensure that the systems that people are using are open and auditable and that there's a lot of funding to actually audit and fix and improve them, then you do better uh, in, if you're playing defense. Um, for this one, um, you can probably find ways of architecting your systems, and that's again a social variable as much as a technical one, so that when, uh, when you need to debug them, uh, you have a way to do so. Uh, not always. I think so, in, in some cases, the things we want to defend are never going to win on this front. Um, 
uh, ability to test whether they have succeeded. I don't think this is addressable fundamentally, generally, by either technological or um, or social or economic means. It's largely a property of like what you're trying to do. Um, maybe maybe there is an answer which is like be wise about what you try to do with computers. Actually, this may be a profound lesson. You know. Um, be realistic about whether you can have a database with five million people's records online somewhere uh, without, without some kind of risk, significant risk that it'll get compromised. And if you do need to have that database there, think about how to stack these other two variables in relation to that thing that you're defending. Figure out how to defend it in depth. I'm Christopher Brooks. Um, so my question is how what you're proposing, how, do you, how would it prevent attacks that are basically about metadata? It turns out, like for phone calls, metadata is really important. There was an interesting article where a terrorist organization was using a particular tool that had a really, you know, that somebody was saying, oh, the NSA, they see that, and it's like, oh, like, let's go look at them. So how do we protect against metadata privacy intrusions? Uh, great question. Uh, and if we had a good answer to it, I'd be up here probably talking about it. Um, Projects like Tor are, to some extent, attempts to defend metadata. But we also know that they're vulnerable to a whole lot of metadata-based attacks uh, around timing and size of communications that the research community has only begun to theorize answers to. Um, it turns out, you know, the obvious thing you might say is, oh, if you can read our traffic by the lengths of the messages we send, then let's try to pad them all. You know, so they're all a standard set of lengths rather than being um, uh, completely continuous distribution. To make this super c concrete um, uh, for the people who are maybe not following the conversation thus far. Um, w as a result of campaigning, EFF and other organizations managed to get Wikipedia to switch from being HTTP to HTTPS. And you might say, what is that good for? Why does it matter? Whether the articles you read are encrypted or unencrypted? And the answer is, one of the reasons it matters, aside from the, the, the privacy dimensions, uh, there are certain things you read on Wikipedia you don't want people to know about. Um, uh, in a lot of countries, there are governments who want to ban specific pages on Wikipedia while allowing the rest of the site to be read. And so by making it the site HTTPS, that's no longer easy to do. It now becomes a game of, OK, there's a connection going to Wikipedia. I don't know what's inside it. I don't know what page it is or what the user is doing. Except it's basically a matter of mathematical necessity that every Wikipedia page has a unique length. Because the space of possible lengths of articles in terms of bytes, like how many bytes are in the page, and at page plus the images, that number basically doesn't really collide for any pages. There's just too many different lengths that things can be. So you definitely want to pad and say, OK, we're going to round every um, page size to a power of 2. Or to be fancier, you know, a power of 1.2. It costs you less bytes. But um, this turns out not to help that much, both because there's still a huge number of lengths, but also because the pattern of requests that we make in general when we go to a page. Maybe it's like load the page and then load five images. Um, uh, or if you're using, say, Gmail and you're about to like open a new message, you can tell the person's opening a new message because the pattern of communications between your browser and Gmail is very distinctive. And this is a totally unsolved research problem. How do we protect um, uh, applications, encrypted applications, against this type of, type of traffic analysis? Probably we have to go back and make a new programming framework that squeezes every application into a rigid um, structure with, with some information theoretic proofs about how much it leaks. Uh, but no one's done that work yet. Uh, and so if you're, if you, if you're a, like a brand new PhD student in computer science or you're looking for a good topic for a research, research project, uh, this is, a, I think, an open space. Um, hey, Peter. Christian Kreivik, ICSI and Lastline. I was wondering if um, maybe one aspect of one of your variables or a new variable might be the the attitude of the contestants as to what is an attack. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically the, the threat model, because you could easily conceive of situations like, you know, simply using Facebook where some people say, you know, the fact that they use my data to, I don't know, give me, you know, targeted advertising is basically an attack there, that extreme, or other people say, this is great because I finally get ads that actually show me something that I want. Um, and so I think a lot of these things can be interpreted depending on how you think about that. Yeah, so there may not be a contest, right? Like the question, is there, is there a contest or not? 
but also, I think there's a little bit of variable three in there, right? Which is, um, you thought that your use of your computer was um, for purpose A, but you didn't realize that purpose A implied things that meant that you didn't get what you wanted. And so, <laughs> there's a question about, can you tell that using Facebook leaks data that you don't want leaked or not? And, and that's like, uh, it's hard to tell until someone comments about it. And so actually, that's the thing that helps people, right? With Facebook, it's kind of, sometimes it's too late, right? Your relatives found out about your political opinions that you didn't want them to find out about or whatever it was, that you were gay, whatever, whatever the, the particular case is. But um, you at least get some kind of lesson in retrospect and, and you can hopefully be a little wiser the next time. Hi, my name is Galina Schwartz, mm -hmm. uh, and I work on uh, security of cyber physical systems, like huge cyber physical systems. Mm -hmm. And uh, I work at ECS, although I'm an economist by training. So, uh, you mentioned the word risk. Uh, just recently, just uh, five minutes ago, you told that five million people data is online, and probably there is some risk there. Okay. So I want to talk about that because risk is a very quantifiable thing. It's probability that this attack will happen and uh, the loss from this attack, how, how much it will cost. And it's just a, a, a product of this too. So I wonder, you talked a lot about our artificial intelligence, automation, like learning all these things and deep things. But I wonder, do you have any thoughts of how, or maybe you could even point me out to some large-scale data that will allow us to estimate this risk? That's a great question. I think the answer is sometimes uh, you can estimate risk. Um, part of the problem is that computers and computer security are changing so fast that any kind of statistics you build from what happened two years ago or five years ago it has the potential to be inapplicable to the environment that, uh, t that pertains to your problem in the next two years. Uh, and so in a lot of cases, I think that type of modeling breaks. But there are some sub-fields in computer security where I think these statistics exist. And uh, people, there are studies out there, for instance, looking at, OK, for different operating systems, when they get a report of a vulnerability, um, where basically the vulnerability is like in some software that everyone uses, but this operating system has a particular version of that. How long does it take the, the operating systems to ship a patch? And like there, you, you, you actually can get pretty good statistics and you can start to say, ah, oh, actually this organization that's shipping this operating system is doing a better job of this other one, than this other one over here. Uh, especially when you can actually compare apples to apples and it's the same vulnerability in the same program distributed through two channels. Another place where you may be able to get statistics um, is in uh, bug finding rates in large code bases. Uh, a third place, I guess, where there's data is the price of vulnerabilities in vulnerability markets. There are some of those out there. Um, but beyond that, you know, for artificial intelligences, I think tomorrow is going to look different to today. And so we're going to have trouble getting precise risk models. Thanks, everyone.